Welcome to the Omnibus Podcast. I'm your host, Jeremy Munson, State Representative from District 23B in Southern Minnesota. This week, Walter Hudson and I co-host the show, and we'll be talking about legislation uh, in and outside the Capitol, the impacts. I'll be talking about some of the emotional legislating that's going on and some of the bills being brought forward. Uh, We'll talk about the Atlanta shooting and what the Stop AAPI hate movement would like you to believe. I'll be talking about some of the spending bills being brought forward by both Republicans and Democrats in St. Paul, uh, even though the federal government is raining money down all across this country on states, counties, cities, and local government. Uh, We'll be talking about some of the uh, individual bills like the school bus bill that's going to be putting cameras on school buses uh, to try to catch drivers, much like the uh, traffic cameras did. Uh, I'll be mentioning the uh, uh, black Republican, black Democrat show that I was on with Representative John Thompson. We'll play a clip for, for you to listen to that. And uh, we'll be talking with Dr. Scott Jensen next Saturday uh, to, about his run for office. So thank you so much for listening to the Omnibus Podcast, where all subjects are germane. All right. I think we're like in uh, week number 10 at the legislature. Things are finally heating up. Uh, we're actually voting on bills on the House floor. Uh, last week, Kurt Doubt uh, whined about how there was only four bills passed and three of them were you know, technical bills. And uh, so then the Democrats scheduled a whole bunch of bills to the, come to the House floor. We could actually debate and pass them. These are what I like to vote on because they're actually single subject bills. They're not omnibus bills. Um, and usually what happens is they cut a few bills loose to come to the, to come to the floor as a single subject to protect, you know, freshman legislators, kind of like give them a bill so they can campaign on having, you know, got this bill through and had the governor sign it. But, uh, today we had four bills hit the floor and, uh, one of them, uh, there was only four of us that voted no on it. And it was a bill that would change life insurance companies kind of uh, process for assessing whether or not you should qualify as life insurance. Walter, do you have, you have life insurance? I do. Yes. You do. I I don't have life insurance. Everybody tries talking me into it, but you know, life insurance is not health insurance. Life insurance is, you know, if you die, uh, you know, you get money to take care of your family, you know, especially in a single, single earner uh, income. Uh, That's important. Well, this life insurance companies can, look at your health. They can look at your lifestyle. They can look at your job to see how dangerous your job is. And they can, they can use whatever they want to calculate the risk of you not dying. That's their job. And as, as somebody who would buy life insurance, the rates that I pay are based on, you know, their model, their economic model, right? The, the better they can make decisions, um, you know, it should be cheaper for me. But what, what's happened is, uh, this bill that came forward said that life insurance companies can no longer look at your prescription drugs for uh, drugs that you take if you were addicted to heroin and you're trying to, you know, recover from heroin, you know? And so it's saying they can't look at that as an indicator of whether they should give you life insurance. Well, if if someone has a, a serious addiction to opiates, um, they actually would be pretty high risk of death. And so it should be within their purview to actually use that information. I don't think it's discriminatory. And it's not like we're denying someone health insurance to say, well, if you're on this, you can't get health insurance. We're just talking about life insurance, which is a non-essential financial product, right? And so I, I voted against that bill because it was going to restrict what life insurance companies could use uh, to determine the best rate for, for, for customers. And there were, I think there were four or five of us that voted no, but everybody in the Senate voted yes. And uh, I'm sure and, and, uh, all, but, all but five of us voted, or four or five of us voted yes in the House. Yeah, I, I wish I could say I'm surprised. I'm not. I am extraordinarily disappointed to learn that there are only four of you who voted against that because it's, it's just such a, it's a political layup, and that's why everybody voted for it. Uh, because at, at face value, on the surface level, you're going out there and saying, hey, look, at I made it easier and cheaper for you to get life insurance. Um, when in point of fact, the opposite is true. Because this passes, the governor signs it, which it sounds like is going to happen. You're, you're not going to see this consequence. 
in, in such a way that you can point at it and go, oh, this is this happened because of this bill. But the consequence will be that once the actuarial tables have been adjusted for this new reality across the board, everybody's going to be paying more. They're going to have to because the cost that you would have specified towards the people who actually have that risk resulting from an opioid addiction now has to be amortized across the entire consumer base. Yeah, there's a lot of changes, especially to insurance that, that come forward. And, and a lot of these are brought forward by the industry, these lobbyists that come forward and say, hey, we want to do this. This was actually the opposite of industry. This was probably somebody's friend or family member that was denied life insurance because of this. And they said, well, that's not right. You know, that would maybe give somebody an incentive not to get help for recovering from an opiate addiction. Well, it isn't. People don't, you know, if it was health insurance or health care, yes, but not a, you know, a life insurance product. I don't, you get into the weeds on things, but I read bills like this and I'm not on the commerce committee. I wish I was. Um, so I didn't get to hear this bill, but um, you hear bills like this and you're like, well, how come nobody's standing up against this thing? And so I just said, I wanted to speak and I wasn't prepared to, sp- I wasn't planning on speaking because I was wearing a hoodie and a baseball cap. Um, I get more dressed up for the podcast that I did on speaking in the house floor, but uh, I, you know, I jumped on and I asked her questions. Um, <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I, I take it back. I did not ask questions on the floor and I, I, I pushed the button, but it was too late to speak. Uh, you're not on the house floor where you can just stand up and be recognized. Um, I did speak on a different bill today and uh, unexpectedly, and, and that one has to do with real estate. Um, I've been in real estate for a little over 20 years and kind of, and I know the process on a lot of stuff. And I got a call recently from a constituent whose dad or grandfather lost their house for non-payment of property taxes. You know, they, they owned the house free and clear, but they were like, must have been two years behind. Maybe there was some, maybe they're senile. Uh, you know, I don't know the situation specifically, but they were two years behind and the, and the county took their property for, for, you know, through tax forfeiture and that the property was worth something. You know, it wasn't just worth the $7,000 in taxes. It was worth 60 or $80,000. The county sells it and the county keeps everything. The homeowner lost everything. And so I, I wrote a bill to actually say when the county takes your property for tax forfeiture and they sell it at auction, they have to give you everything that, you know, above and beyond the taxes and some reasonable expenses. But a bill came to the floor today that would prevent a company coming forward to uh, make a deal with the person at the last minute to kind of like, hey, I'll give you a little bit of money and then you quit claim deed the property over to me so they don't have to go buy it at auction. Um, and uh, the bill the bill's really detailed and it usually prote- it protects people about losing their property where it would go to the bank. Um, so I don't know, we had a little debate on the floor about it, but Try to get involved in every bill and you just can't possibly make the arguments against every single bill. And of course, you're really not changing any minds on the floor anyways. No. And that's the sad part is that, you know, on in our deliberations, and again, this is a, a product of the Minnesota's open meetings law, but in the context of a city council or any other municipal body, you are actually having a good faith discussion about public policy. Because you can't have a discussion. You can't decide the issue before. That's against the law. You can't have a conversation about the issue before with a quorum of your body. That's against the law. And so the debates that you're hearing in the city council chamber or the school board is a, a, an actual good faith discussion where people are hearing presentations for the first time, reacting to them, processing the information, having a conversation, asking questions, developing their opinions, and it's all happening organically on the fly. You'd like to think that that's what's happening on the House floor, but it's not. It's it's mostly theatrical. It's mostly, uh, for all intents and purposes, scripted, with the exception of yourself. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's you know it's it's nice <laughs> to have a conversation um, about all the legislation, and it's really important to know the impacts. But you're right; a lot of the caucusing of these bills happens behind closed doors, where uh, thankfully lobbyists can't go into caucus, but um, you know, their representatives, uh, as legislators do, and they present cases for or against, and, um, people tend not to do their homework on a lot of stuff. Uh, speaking of conflict of interest, um, the Minnesota reformer, some, you know, pretty liberal paper called me yesterday for an interview about, uh, a bill that I'm, I'm carrying, uh, that would actually ban 
legislators from working for companies whose sole sole purpose is lobbying or public policy. And um, I, I brought this bill forward, obviously, because of our frustration with uh, Representative Doubt taking a job working for a DC lobbying firm called Stateside and Associates. Um, lobbyists obviously are, are pretty thick at the Capitol, but Stateside found a way around the law because if you're a lobbyist, you actually have to register as a lobbyist. It's kind of self-reporting. You register with the campaign finance board. Um, what Stateside does is they realize that people that run for House and Senate, you know, they're willing to take a job for 45 grand a year. Um, we could give them a $100,000 salary to be an employee of Stateside, and they would be the best lobbyists we could ever hire because they're on the inside. And especially if you hire people that are in influential roles. And as long as they don't register as a lobbyist, it's legal in Minnesota because you can't be a lobbyist and a legislator. So what uh, they did with Kurt Dowd is they hired him to be their political affairs director, which is the same title lobbyists have. But instead of him registering as a lobbyist, he gets to kind of hire lobbyists that would work for, you know, represent state, their, the stateside clients. And, uh, and that, that allows them to get around the law. So uh, it's illegal in Minnesota for a lobbyist to give me $5. But a lobbying firm can give me a hundred thousand dollar a year salary, and that's okay. And so that's what my bill would change, because uh, the reformer today wrote an article about a Democrat legislator who is a lawyer for the teachers union, and basically works for this company whose sole purpose is to enact uh, you know policy at the state capitol and get funding. Um, which is about 40% of our state budget, right? Billions and billions of dollars and how, how big a conflict of interest that is. Yeah. And, and again, I am, my, my mind turns to municipal analogs and this would be somewhat analogous to if I was hired on some position with a company that was contracting with us to resurface our roads or something along those lines, the, the conflict of interest is obvious um, I am making public policy decisions that have a direct impact upon my own financial well-being as an individual. That is no less true of Kurt Doubt and his situation um, and any other legislator who is employed by a lobbying firm, regardless of whether or not they're the ones who are pulling the proverbial trigger. I mean, the, the other thing that came to mind, and maybe it's a, a little bit of a hyperbolic comparison, but the mafia, the fact that the the way that the, the mafia dons kept from being persecuted or prosecuted for their crimes was through having these buffers and deniability of, well, I wasn't there. I didn't pull the trigger. I, I have no idea what you're talking about. When in point of fact, everybody in the room knows they're the ones who are giving the orders. And it's a very similar arrangement where you have, you know, Kurt Doubt screwing past the law by being able to technically say, well, I'm not a registered lobbyist, even though he's the one uh, with his hand in the sock puppet of the actual lobbyists that he's hired on behalf of. This yeah. Company. Well, and, and you know, the big difference, I mean, Kurt brings up his, in his defense, he says, well, you know, I'm not a lobbyist. Well, you're not registered as one. You're, you're, you are lobbying for legislation for your clients. Um, the, the other, the, the, the bigger difference, and he, he talks about like, well, you're, you know, Here's a farmer and he's on the ag policy committee. So he's setting ag policy that, that controls his industry. Or, um, here's a, a real estate agent that is sitting on the housing committee, uh, deciding landlord tenant law, right? There is a conflict a, a little bit, but I know that this person is a landlord or this person is a real estate agent and I can see the conflict with, with someone who works for stateside associates. I don't know who their clients are. I li you know, they list 20 clients on their website and they're, you know, uh, they represent major uh, multinational corporations, pharmaceutical companies, communication companies that are into broadband. Um, there, there are a ton of, of conflicts. There was a bill that came across the floor last year on eBay. They wanted something, right? You know, one of their clients. So who are you representing? Are you representing your constituents or are you representing stateside and associates, one of their clients? Because I can't tell the difference. And, th and that's what's that's what's so difficult when you work for a lobbying firm that represents hundreds of clients is that uh, we don't know what you know what legislation they're supporting and why. 
it's very similar to the conversation we had in a previous episode where we were talking about campaign finance, where, you know, ostensibly uh, the, the process is there trying to, to keep money out of the, the process. But in actuality, the effect is that it actually muddies the waters where if you just, if you just let individuals contribute to their heart's content, then you would know who is contributing. But when you let the PACs do it, uh, then you're actually masking who's giving the money and, and uh, what the motives are of these different groups that just have these innocuous names and don't identify the actual interests that they're serving. The other thing that comes to mind is, you know, to, to further your point regarding, you know, let's say a landlord who um, is a legislator and is on a committee that's uh, considering policy that affects uh, rental properties. Not only is that a known relationship or a known status that can be taken into consideration politically, but on top of that, landlords should be represented in a conversation about policy that affects them, right? I mean, the, the notion that if you're affected by policy, you shouldn't have anything to do with the conversation. Well, that excludes everyone because I mean, that, that the whole point of representation is that your interests, your values are being presented and accounted for in the deliberative process. There's a difference between that and the kind of direct financial conflict of interest where you have a financial incentive to forego the best argument in favor of a particular policy uh, because you're being paid to do so directly. It's a totally different categorical uh, scenario than merely having a, an economic interest because of your occupation. Yeah, well, you know, last year, um, Mohammed Noor, uh, DFL uh, House member, carried some bills uh, expanding tenants' rights. And we had a long drawn out debate. I was in the housing committee last year. I was, and then on the house floor, we, we went at it again. And um, I voted against these provisions. They passed because I'm in the minority. And my local newspaper ran a, a headline, Munson, comma, landlord, comma, votes against tenants' rights or something like that. You know, it's like, well, wait a minute. Mohammed Noor is a tenant. He, he lives in an apartment. Why doesn't it say Muhammad right. Noor, right. comma, you know, tenant, you know, votes to expand tenant rights? You know, like, why is it all of a sudden, you know, bad against me because of uh, my, my experience in owning rental properties? It's uh, so I, I think people, you know, out in the public, especially despise lobbyists, right? Where they have perhaps greater access to legislators. They push their agenda. Um, I know some really good lobbyists in, in St. Paul that, you know, are advocating for, you know, nonprofit hospitals and such. And then I know some uh, lobbyists that are just, they'll take on clients from any, anywhere uh, and push any, any provision they want, especially when it comes to some, you know, pretty, pretty difficult ones to swallow like tobacco and pharmaceutical companies and in, in pushing their agenda. But um, I think it's really important to have transparency. And like you said, especially in campaign finance report uh, reforms, you know, I think you should expand how much individuals can give to candidates so that we know where the money is going. Um, you know, if a pharmaceutical company wants us to give $20,000 to a certain representative, then that person is going to be, be very transparent on how that person votes. But if that pharmaceutical company donates money to um, the Jobs Coalition PAC, which then goes out and, and sends negative campaign mailers against that representative's opponent, then, you know, it's difficult to know. It's harder to track that information. This week in transportation, a, a bill, actually, no, it was in commerce. Uh, this week in commerce, a bill came to the committee where Calbar uh, sits, and the, the bill was going to be putting uh, school bus stop arm cameras uh, on, this, on the actual arm so that when the arm swings out, the camera can record cars that are breaking the law by passing the school bus. Yeah, and uh, th the idea is that they'll do that to um, you know, give out more tickets and, uh, and raise revenue to implement some safety programs. What that bill won't do is, you know, prevent a driver from hurting a child because it's only going to record something after the fact. That's, that was really important. All right. So, so the bill came to the Commerce Committee um, and uh, I think everybody voted for it uh, except for Cal Barr. I think you brought up some good arguments about how installing a a video camera on the traffic arm to record violators and then send them tickets 
was really mirroring the same policy they had in place where they put traffic cameras at, at red lights to record people going through intersections and then sending them a ticket uh, because it was thrown out by our courts. Um, and, you know, violation of, well, I don't, what do you think, Walter? I mean, this is unconstitutional by our courts. You think this follows the same thing? I don't know what the rationale was that the court offered to toss out the red light cameras. Uh, but in terms of what rationale I would use if I was considering whether or not this ought to pass constitutional muster, the, the issue that I have with red light cameras or something like this, where you're, you're putting up a surveillance device for the, the purpose of a, a constant monitoring, it's not situational, it's constant, right? It, it has an air of breaking the fourth amendment where there, there is no, um, inherent, there's no probable cause. Like you're just searching. You're just invading uh, on the presumption that something is going wrong when you when you don't have any evidence for that. Uh, by virtue of the fact that I'm sitting in front of a school bus, uh, that is not probable cause for you to be monitoring me, recording me, um, collecting evidence against me. And so I, I imagine that the rationale that the court had for overturning red light cameras would apply to these school bus arm cameras as well. Yeah, and I found out it was in 2007 that the Minnesota Supreme Court delivered a unanimous decision striking down the legality of red light cameras. Um, so, I mean, they, I'm presumably they would they would find the the same uh, decision here, but it's uh, I, I think Cal brought up a very good argument of why this bill shouldn't move forward. Um, I have had legislators tell me that it's not their job to determine the constitutionality of laws that they're passing which I kind of would agree with, right? But it, but if you know that this is an issue, then we should figure this out before it goes into goes into law. Well, you'll hear the courts say the same thing though. You'll you'll hear courts say that they defer to the legislative intent and to the political process. You know, the if if this was passed by the legislature, then there must be a presumption of constitutionality. You've heard rulings along those lines. So, it, when you've got both branches deferring on who gets to determine what's constitutional and what's not, then nobody's determining it. And uh, you, you would think that you would have an interest, e even if you're making a technical argument. I was unaware that the, it was a rampant problem that required a, a new creative legislative solution. It, it occurs to me that it, it's probably one of the easiest possible things to monitor. You know exactly when and where school buses are going to be making their stops. It's a regular schedule down to the minute. So if you want to have patrols targeting um, violators should be a relatively easy thing to arrange. I don't see why you need to have uh, an, an automated process, uh, a RoboCop, if you will, um, going around giving people citations uh, under the, the presumption of a violation as opposed to reacting to probable cause in the moment. So I, th these bills come up uh, three years ago, there was a bill that came up because uh, somebody in Wisconsin uh, was a kid was high on whippets, you know, the nitrous oxide from uh, whipped cream cans or ready whip. He got high on that and then killed someone. And so they found out that I mean, with a car. And so they wanted to add that chemical that's in uh, Ready Whip to be one of the chemicals they can test for for DUIs. I mean, it, it opens up this big broad thing because you can't do it with a breathalyzer. It's got to be a blood test. And it would be, I mean, it happened once in Wisconsin, and they want to make it a state law in Minnesota that impacts you know, all drivers when there's an issue. And so it was, I think it's, people like to legislate by emotion and they want to have that person testify in committee. And it takes a very bold legislator to listen to very, you know, very deep testimony about the loss of life and then vote against that, you know, that person's presumably interest. But, you know, nothing that we're going to pass today is going to bring their loved one back. Um, we had the same thing happen with hands free legislation, right? The hands free debate. Um, you know, people texting while driving. Um, 
they wanted us to ban texting when the law that, that they passed actually says it's, it's legal to text while driving as long as you do it hands-free. And there's nothing on your phone or in the wireless carrier uh, or on the message itself that says this message was sent hands-free. So if someone is driving, sends a text message, crashes and kills someone two seconds later, there's no way to prove that that person was not texting hands-free. So the bill that was passed doesn't do anything, doesn't give any justice to anybody that was hurt by hands-free texting. Um, it, it causes police officers to have to watch in people's car, they're driving down the road to see if they're you know, violating the law. But there's nothing that uh, you know, legislatively solved anything. It actually legalized texting. Um, so we see that a lot with emotional legislating. And uh, I think you have to separate that as a legislator and say, what are we really doing here? Does this bill actually, is it enforceable? Um, this one with the school buses, I don't think it's constitutional. And uh, so I, I don't know if it's going to do anything. It's already a very serious offense to pass a school bus with its, when it has its arm out and light slashing. Yeah, that that's the real problem, isn't it? Is the emotional legislating and the weaponization of emotion as a political tool for campaigning. You know, when when your when your legislative objective becomes secondary to your campaign objective. And unfortunately, we know that happens a lot more often than uh, than perhaps some politicians would like to admit. It's very harmful. I mean, you, if, if it's not good policy and the only reason you're forwarding it is so that you can go around campaigning about what an awesome person you are and you are functionally and perhaps profoundly impacting people's real lives in a negative way, uh, that's a level of recklessness, which in and of itself ought to be considered out, outside the, the scope of, of civilized behavior. Yeah, and that, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's done here at the legislature. Uh, it's you know, it's it's more political than actually doing the work of the people. Uh, a lot of the votes that we see on the House floor, where someone you know brings up a motion to force a vote, even though they know the results of the vote, you know, it's not going to be in their favor. They do it so that uh, they try to get the other side to to vote uh, against something that they can campaign on, showing that they you know they should have voted one way and they voted the other way. So they obviously they twist twist votes all the time. Uh, we saw that this week when uh, Representative Dowd's been trying to, uh, you know, show how much that uh, Republicans support police, and brought forward yeah. brought forward a bill that would uh, create this thirty five million dollar safe account. Uh, it's a it's a revolving fund for uh, riot control in the Twin Cities, and uh, they they decided to do this during the Chauvin trial to say well. Police officers from outside the metro come to Minneapolis, and there's this mutual aid agreement where Minneapolis has to pay police officers, uh, kind of reimburse them. So if Albert, Albertville police come to Minneapolis um, and they do the work to help for, during a riot, that Minneapolis has to pay them. And uh, what I found in talking to officers in my district is they don't want to go to Minneapolis. They say that's the fastest way to go and end their career. So uh, they don't; they have no interest in going there. There is instead of Minneapolis paying for these police, uh, the governor has asked for this this riot fund to be set up called the Safe Account, and there'd be thirty five million dollars in there, and that can be used to pay police. Well, Minneapolis is kind of defunding their police. We don't want to end up having to pay for policing in Minneapolis, and so uh, most people in rural Minnesota say, "No, we don't need this thing." And the, what furthermore, um, what happened in the last week, Joe Biden signed this one one point nine trillion dollar uh, bailout and, uh, for, you know, that sends money all over the country, obviously stimulus people, uh, stimulus checks to people, but then also sends money directly to every state, every county, every city and every single township in America gets a check. Um, and so I got a list of them. And I added up just Minneapolis, just St. Paul, and Ramsey and Hennepin County. And those four entities get $805 million from the federal government. So oh we don't need Lord. to set up. Yeah. That is we don't insane. Need to, 
that's an insane amount. I should have got the St. Michael and Albertville uh, uh, amounts too, because small towns, I mean, little, my little township, which is 36 square miles, maybe 120 people live in, in our, you know, my little township, we get $20,000 uh, for our township, which manages a few roads. But uh, there's an insane amount of money coming to cities. And I've heard from county commissioners that say they haven't even spent the CARES Act money from last year. And, you know, they got 150 grand. Now they've got a quarter million dollars coming. They don't even know what to spend it on. Um, they're not going to send it back. They'll find stuff. But uh, the, the stipulation in this federal law says that they're giving all this money to governments, but governments can't lower taxes. So you can't use the money to lower taxes. Even if you had taxes, uh, tax laws or ordinances that were going to go into effect, you can no longer put those into effect. So a sunsetting tax. That has to be unconstitutional. Yeah, and, it, and it goes that, through. That has, how can you mandate? How, how can you possibly mandate at the federal level what a municipality's tax policy is going to be? You're going well, to tell me that I can't lower taxes on my own residence? Not if you're getting free money from Uncle Sam. And, and that can you is, turn it down? Well, certainly you could turn it down. But what bureaucrat would turn away free federal money? Because that's how everybody refers to it um, you know, in the, uh, in, 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 in the state capital, is we want to leverage federal dollars. Like, this is taxpayer money, too. But, but, but you're right. You could turn it away. Um, but there are challenges to that now. A bunch of Republican attorneys general are asking uh, uh, Janet Yellen to make a decision on how this, how this is actually interpreted. Because I can understand that you know Democrats voted for this for these 1.9 trillion dollar stimulus bill, and they don't want to send two billion dollars to Minnesota and then have Minnesota lawmakers just give it to the people. I mean, I certainly would like to do that, but. I can see why they don't. They didn't want that to happen, but to say that we can't for, like forgive tax on the the forgiven PPP loans, which we want to do, which a lot of states have done, that appears to be against the law under this fe federal stimulus bill. Yeah, it's fairly insidious when you think about it, because if, if the at face value, the rationale for any sort of government aid in a scenario like this is. Uh, to to help people out of a bind, to to help the American citizen, to help the resident. Okay, so you're saying that you can't provide help in the form of lower taxes. Well, why? What what if in the judgment of local officials, state officials, that's the best way to provide aid, assistance, relief to your residents? Why is that option off the table? The only answer that occurs to me, like the real answer as to why that's off the table, is because the goal here is not to help. The goal here is to expand and solidify the grip of government. Because think about what happens if you take this money, you can't lower taxes, you factor it into your budget moving forward. And I think you made this point as well, Jeremy, and, and that might have been where I got it from. What happens when the money runs out? And now you're used to having it and you're used to having the services or the assets, whatever it is that you've been paying for with this free government handout. Well, now the only way to maintain your new level of service is to raise taxes on your residents, on your taxpayers. Uh, so this, this creates an incentive and a, a sort of a, a momentum and inertia in the direction of bigger and more expansive government across the board at all levels. And, and I, I think, and I want to take this even further. I think it creates an addiction. I mean, that's what they're, they're, they're giving us that first, that big push of yes. a very highly addictive drug that will grow government programs and that money will run out and they're going to go out and hire workers for this new program Oh, it's only going to be for 18 months. And we know how that turns into, well, we can't, you can't shut it off. Look at the services that we've turned on for these people. Um, that, that's, a, that's going to be a problem in the future. And I was talking to Representative Groffel about this because there's, I forgot the terminology, but there's, there's something in, in, when you get federal money that there's uh, an understanding that, that 
the programs that you have in place now must continue. If they're adding federal dollars into healthcare for a specific purpose, that can grow, but you just can't take that money and put it elsewhere. You know, you can't shift, you know, existing dollars to something else. So uh, there's an expectation that if they're giving you dollars for healthcare, that your healthcare budget must grow. And that usually means you're going to be touching more people, offering more services, and eventually you'll have to shut that off if the money runs out. Uh, with, with, I mean, with that understanding that all of the cities in the metro were receiving this enormous influx of money, the argument that Drazkowski made on the floor, he stood up and was just like, we, we did talk about this bill. The Democrats brought forward this bill uh, for the $35 million plus a bunch of police restrictions and policies, which, you know, it was a non-starter. Um, doubt offered before an, an amendment to strip out the provisions, but still keep the funding. We voted yes on that because it was a good amendment to improve the bill, but we voted no on the bill altogether. But the fact that he brought this thing forward after the cities have got so much money from, from the federal government was completely unnecessary. We have to stop spending more money. That's the last thing we should be doing. So, um, the five of us in the new house caucus voted no. All the other Republicans voted yes to spend more money. And, uh, you know, I, I think that the argument that Draz made on the floor was really compelling and, um, uh, and I think it upset a lot of people watching that vote, uh, you know, happen live. Yeah. Once again, not surprised, but disappointed. Yeah. <laughs> so yesterday I was invited to be on the, uh, the show Black Republican, Black Democrat. Um, guess which one I was playing? And I, I was. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was invited to be on the show with uh, Representative John Thompson, uh, which I like to put in parentheses, D, not Hugo. Like that's not the town he represents. But of course, he's famous for his performance in Hugo, um, where, you know, he threatened to burn the town down and uh, during his political activism moments. So that, that was a pretty good show and a lot of really heated debate. So uh, I encourage you to to check it out. I think it's on their Facebook page. So yeah, just black uh, black Republican, black Democrat, and uh, not all the the debate was between uh, John Thompson and I. Um, the the hosts were also uh, pretty angry at each other. But we talk about the uh, what happened in the U.S. Capitol on the sixth of January, and we talk about some equity versus equality. Uh, John Thompson, of course, has the bill that basically just uh, spends money to end racism. And uh, we talked about some rent control that he, he wants to have in Minneapolis, which uh, is a terrible idea. And uh, it's it's good conversation, but I, I recommend checking it out. Yeah, everyone knows that's how racism is solved. You just pour money on it and it goes away. It's like throwing water on the Wicked Witch of the West. Cash money on racism makes it melt. <laughs> yeah. On this week's version of uh, legislating, uh, I want to talk about the technology that's used uh, around legislating during the you know COVID shutdown since we're not actually physically in committee and on the floor. This has been a really interesting year with everything being on Zoom, and I think we covered that in our first um, podcast, just how the public is shut out. Um, but one of the advantages of having everything on Zoom, uh, for especially for rural legislators like me, um, I live about 110 miles from the Capitol, and so a lot of my constituents are that or even further away from the Capitol. And when you have a bill that's heard in committee, um, you you like to invite people from your district who have an interest in that bill to testify for or against it at the Capitol. And usually, when you testify on a bill, um, you're only allowed to have you know two minutes. And so I brought a, a mayor and a, a city administrator from the city of Vernon Center up to testify on a bill uh, last year on a bonding bill. And we got up there and sat and waited in committee for four hours. Uh, they had, you know, about a hundred projects in front of us and they, you know, they got to listen to all these, you know, bills that were, you know, wants, not needs, but just enormous projects. And they sat and waited and waited and I bought them dinner. And then finally, uh, you know, 10 o'clock at night, they got their two minutes and then they drove home. So that was a long drive for two minutes of testimony. But with Zoom, I had a, I had a bill hearing this week and I had someone from the city of Madison Lake zoom in 
give their testimony. They share their screen. They walk people through a presentation for a couple minutes and, and then they disconnected. So they, it's easier for them to be engaged through Zoom, um, for, you know, for committee hearings. Um, but what it doesn't allow is people like you to be in the room and in, you know, hold your signs up and basically show your presence in support of a bill. Um, so that's what's missing, but it is nice for, for testimony. Um, on the house floor, the technology, how it works is they built us uh, software for voting. So on the house floor at my desk, I have a little panel that says it's got buttons on it. It says, yay. Another one says, nay. Another one says reset. And then I have a page button to call a page. Um, and they've built us a digital version of that on my desktop. If I plug it in, I connect through VPN and uh, there's a, a thumbprint scanner that plugs into my laptop. And then whenever a vote comes up on the floor where they open the board, it's called where that the board with all the red and green lights, um, the board is opened. I'm required to scan my thumb for every vote. And then I can vote yes, no, change my vote. And during the debate, there's another button that is a request to speak button, which is the equivalent of standing. When you're on the house floor, you stand to be recognized by the speaker and they put you on a list of uh, people to speak. So I think the technology works pretty well. I think it works actually too well. So now you'll have legislators uh, who live, you know, four or five or seven hours away from the Capitol that uh, actually prefer to not drive to St. Paul and prefer to do everything through Zoom. And so um, as much as I want to fight to get back on the floor, um, I think it's not Democrats that I'm actually going to be fighting against. I think a majority of legislators are going to like this uh, remote legislating. It's easy and uh, they don't have to face big groups of protesters at the Capitol. And uh, it makes their, you know, you'll, you'll have people actually going to Arizona for the winter. There's some snowbirds in the legislature that would like to retire from lawmaking because they want to be in Arizona. Well, now with a digital Zoom background that shows you're in your legislative office, which I see people using now, um, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's going to be easy for them to do that. So that, that's what's on the technology front um, with, with Zoom. I, you know, it, it works well, but I think it works too well. It's interesting because I remember during the height of the Tea Party, there was conversation and never went anywhere, but there was conversation about making technological changes to how legislatures and Congress does their business to make use of these sort of remote technologies that everybody's using now. And the idea was that it would facilitate going back to part-time legislation, where instead of having this lifestyle where you're living at a Capitol building and, and living in the vicinity, like in the, in the beltway, as they say, that everyone was on, on weekends and evenings uh, zooming in and it, that that would kind of incentivize doing less and push us back towards kind of the original vision of what Congress was, which was, you know, you're a farmer, you're a lawyer, you're, you live an actual life and then you travel to the Capitol, have a short session where you take care of very essential things and you hurry up and get it done so you can get back and take care of your crops, right? Um, unfortunately, I think that might have been a naive vision. <laughs> like, I, I don't know that governments are going to be doing less in the age of remote digital legislation. Yeah, well... <laughs> I hope we can figure things out to be like, there's a, there's a good balance. I, I've long said that we don't need a full-time legislature because if we have a full-time year round legislature, we're going to get more laws. And I think we need less. Uh, my cousin is a lawmaker in North Dakota. Um, she's a Democrat, but fairly conservative by Minnesota standards. And they meet for six weeks every other year. So th I think that's a really good, I mean, they, and they figure out a budget um, they do all their policies and, uh, yes, they have less people, but they still, I mean, I, I think we have too many laws in Minnesota. And I think part of that is because we meet too often. And if we finish our work on a certain topic and we have two weeks left of, of the legislative session, we're going to look for other things to meddle with. How else can government get involved with other stuff? And so, um, I, I, I support having a part-time legislature. Um, I do want to see more people who are in the prime earning years of their life and are busy with young, young kids um, and are relevant to be a good representative 
in St. Paul. I don't want to see a bunch of 70 year olds up there who are retired and looking for something to do. Um, I also don't like to see 21 year old legislators who have no experience in the working world and they are armed with a political science degree from a liberal college and think that they want to write laws for the rest of us. Right. So, uh, you know, or people that just go in, they go into a career in politics. I, I want to get a good balance of people up in St. Paul. And for that, we do need some, you know, maybe some flexibility. Maybe it's just a, a, a more part time legislature than it is even now. Maybe we shouldn't be there for, you know, four months every single year. Yeah. So I. I've been seeing, of course, right now, part of the hot news cycle is this shooting that took place in, I believe it's Atlanta at a massage parlor where a um, criminal shooter who the more we hear about him, the crazier he sounds. uh, it, It turns out he had a thing against massage parlors or he had a sex addiction and that compelled him to to punish the purveyors of his temptation. And so he went after the, the employees in this massage parlor. Eight of the 10 victims who were shot were Asian women. And so journalists, politicians, activists have been out loud and confident condemning this as a prima facie incident of anti-Asian hate crime. And, you know, they've been talking about stop Asian uh, hate, anti-Asian hate. And what some people may not know is that this is actually, this is not a new thing. It's an emergent thing, but it's something that has been uh, popping up online on social media for some weeks now of stop. I forget exactly what the acronym is, but uh, Asian American Pacific Islander hate, AAPI, I believe is the, the hashtag. And I find the whole thing extremely curious because what, what they seem to be suggesting, you know, they'll throw out the, the claim that the number of incidents of quote unquote hate crimes has increased in the past however many months. And then they'll try to tie that to rhetoric surrounding uh, the coronavirus and its origins out of China. And the case that they seem to be making is that if you in any way connect the coronavirus with China, which is, of course, a factual connection that is undisputed and 100% true, that if you talk about that at all, then you are partially responsible for the supposed hate crimes that have been taking place. Now, what seems to be missing from this, as far as I can see, is I don't, I'm not hearing any names named of like, where is this hate coming from? When you, when you walk up to me and you say, stop anti-Asian hate, what am I personally, me, Walter Hudson, what am I supposed to do with that? Because personally, I never started anti-Asian hate. I'm not involved in anti-Asian hate. No one in my sphere of influence is talking about or dealing with or engaging in anti-Asian hate. So what am I supposed to do with that exhortation? I'm clearly meant to do something because everybody's shouting it at me. What is the thing I'm supposed to be doing? Because I'm not hearing anybody named of like this person said or did these specific things that need to be addressed. If, if that was the claim, then we could all turn our attention to the sp- specific aspects of that claim. It seems like the overall strategy is to keep things as vague and unspecified as possible. And the cynic in me says, so that that can then be weaponized against anybody who does what I'm doing right now and stands up and says, whoa, wait a minute, what are we even talking about here? I agree with you. And I, I think that you know, a lot of this, of course, has come up because of, you know, Donald Trump using the word Wuhan flu or, or Kung flu or uh, Wuhan virus, uh, China virus. I mean, and, and I saw this right away when, you know, about a year ago, when they were claiming that there was a bunch of hate crimes being committed against people of Asian descent because people thought that they were bringing the, you know, COVID to our shores. 
Um, and, and, and it, it, it doesn't make sense. I don't think that there was this enormous outflow, but I think that if there's uh, several crimes that occur, um, I think that reporters look for race as one of the first factors. Like what do these have in common? They first look to race, you know, in, in what happened in Atlanta, the first thing they did was looked at race and not occupation. When his parents came out and said that, that he had a sex addiction, the, the media should have changed it to be about their occupation because they were sex workers or they were running, you know, salons that did more than just massage. And that's why he lashed out at them um, because of the industry that they were in, not their race. And unfortunately, because race is such a hot, divisive issue, um, it is almost impossible to strip it away from the headlines and do a retraction because uh, that's just how the media operates. They love to see that fuel. And, you know, our chair of our party went out and, and did a press release about hate crimes in the headlines, uh, you know, earlier today, even I believe after it's been known that it was not about race, that it was about uh, you know, his sex addiction. And that's, that's why he targeted them. So even on the Republican side, there's, you know, misinformation being spread. It's just, it's incredibly irresponsible. And you see this happen all the time now. And, and it's become institutionalized. It's so irresponsible to come out in the early moments of a story and declare definitively that you know what it was all about and then immediately start weaponizing that for political effect. And, you know, the, the claim, uh, especially on the left and especially in the wake of uh, Biden being inaugurated and Trump being out, the claim is they want unity. They want to bring us together. They want a big kumbaya moment. This is not how people who want to bring a country together, this is not how they behave. You want to bring a country together, you proceed with sobriety and caution and care, and you wait and see what the facts are, and then you speak to those facts. You don't immediately dive in with your divisive race rhetoric and the assumption that the country's all turning anti-Asian because of some statistical uh, trends that you see forming. Um, within law enforcement. And the other thing that's suspicious about this is almost every article I've seen that's reported on this c explicitly contains quote unquote verbal abuse. Or one article had the phrase incidents of name calling included in their statistical total of quote unquote hate crimes. So somebody drives by you and shouts a name or shout something that's offensive to you. And that's a hate crime on par with assault, according to the way it's being reported by today's journalists. And so the whole thing just seems like a rhetorical political tactic to try to inflame and further divide rather than get to the core of what the actual problem is and, and do something sensible in response to it. Yeah. And I'm looking at the headlines at all the different articles and every one of them mentions uh, a sex addiction. So I, I don't understand how it got to be uh, so twisted into race. Although if there was, uh, I'm sure the reporters instantly went out and find the person's social media account and uh, try to determine political affiliation so that they can uh, you know, use that in, in their uh, reporting as well. Well, they've edited their headlines from what they were just a few hours ago. I mean, this morning, people were still talking about this as a racially motivated hate crime. And now they're backtracking. Oh, well, at least it's, it's good to see some retraction happening. And I see that uh, stopaapihate.org is, is a thing. It's a website and uh, allows yep. you to report, you know, hate crimes uh, anonymously in, you know, eight different languages. So it is uh, a way for them to start collecting information. The other thing that occurs to me on this is... What it, when you say stop AAPI hate? What are you talking about? Like, what am I supposed to do? What are we supposed to do to quote unquote stop it? Because as it stands, all of these incidents are against the law. There is no lobby to make it legal to assault Asian people, right? Like, the, these crimes are being per prosecuted as crimes. 
and the, the people who committed them are being arrested. And they're, it's not socially acceptable. There's no contingent of our society that's arguing in defense of what this guy did or that's arguing that we ought to be going around committing acts of violence against Asian people in retaliation for COVID-19. This is not a narrative that exists literally anywhere. And so when you say stop AAPI hate, I don't know what you're talking about. We, we are stopping it by arresting the people who are committing these crimes and prosecuting them under the laws that have already been written. And which kind of goes to the, the, the point you were talking to earlier about the emotionalism and legislating. You, you get something that happens that's already against the law. You know, you see this a lot with mass shootings. You get something that happens that's already against the law. And the prescription is we need to pass another law to make it even more illegal to do this thing that was illegal in the first place. Maybe, just maybe, it's not a lack of law that resulted in the incident taking place. Maybe there are other reasons, contributing factors that have nothing whatsoever to do with how much power government has. So what's next with, with, uh, with all this uh, hatred? How is, how is Joe Biden as president going to change things? Because uh, you know, I know that we keep talking about or I, we keep hearing in the media about how much more Donald Trump increased you know, hate in this country. What is Joe Biden going to do to to heal this nation? What's his responsibility? Well, he's going to follow the lead of John Thompson, which is spend a bunch of money on it because that's how we fix it, right? I mean, and I joke, I jest, but that's correct. Like that is the prescription. The prescription is let's spend a bunch of money on our political priorities and create new programs and create new bureaucracy administration. And that's going to be how we snuff out the hate. Now, there's no explanation of technically how that works or what metrics you're going to look at to determine that you've been successful. And indeed, the hope likely is that that they they will be able to continue to claim that they aren't having success because then they can continue to justify further expense. Well, I hope we can all get along in this country and and finally get over this. And I I feel like a lot of that has to do with what we do in our schools, Um, like we've talked about in previous podcasts with, uh, um, you know, racial uh, equity versus equality in our schools and and how we how we teach our kids about race. So once again, don't forget to tune in to next week's podcast. Uh, Walter and I will be interviewing uh, doctor and former Senator Scott Jensen. Uh, about his stance on the Second Amendment. There's been a lot of questions uh, brought forward about his stance on the Second Amendment, so we thought we would have him on the show so we can answer everything, and we'll probably ask him questions about uh, public health policy as well. It's going to be a great show. Again, it's a uh, former senator, doctor, I actually have to say doctor and former senator, Scott Jensen. So please tune in for the next episode. Have a great week, and if you have any questions on stuff that you want to uh, Uh, have us talk about on the show uh, please feel free to reach out to Walter or I uh, or you can message us through the Facebook page at uh, The Omnibus Podcast on Facebook